Hello and welcome to our Friday webinar. We are back. We're back with part two of, but I read it on the internet <laughs> with Lisa Bono. Welcome, Lisa. Hi. Can't wait to see um, what we what we dig up today on on things that you might read online. Um, yeah. Oh, and uh, as a way for people to log in, um, I I think you touched upon uh, the thought that last time we were on um, that you don't want to be like you know, like you, you learn about something and that's it. Cause my dad used to always say, you never want to be an expert because if you're an expert, you're an ex learner. So. Correct. Um, yes. Yeah. I like that. I like that. And I also have to um, say that last week you had reminded me that um, this is your 50th year in um, business with the fevers making pellets. And I sat there and I thought about it and I do remember when I was young, um, probably in my very early teens, going to the pet store to buy food. And I remember seeing the little tubs of Nutriberries oh. and buying them for my parakeets and cockatiels. So after you said that, I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, I was wrong. It wasn't in the 90s. It was before that. So thanks for pointing that out. Yeah, no, it's awesome. So, yeah, fifth uh, Libby was fiftieth anniversary. Yeah, yeah. So, um, let's see here. If oh, <laughs> I I see some people popping on uh, saying how hot it is in their area, so hopefully if it's if it's hot where you are, that you're you're taking precautions to stay cool and hydrated, uh, as well as your your birds. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> um, and let's see. It, we're uh, we're going to be another presentation today. I hope, right? Because I love I love the presentations. Um, yes. Sweet. And if you have a question, let's see if you're joining us and you have a question for Lisa, we'll see if we can get to it um, after the presentation. Um, so yeah, let's see. Yeah, it's it's a it's like a frying pan basically over a, a lot of the country, a lot of the U.S. right now. <laughs> so, yeah. Except for that. I also, so, want to say, I also want to say I apologize to everybody that I wasn't able to send the link out to like I usually do. Somebody must have flagged me along the way and for whatever reason on my page and I was not able to share the link. So hopefully others were able to find it with the instructions or, you know, had the link directly sent to them. So um, hopefully we can get a lot more afterwards and maybe I could share it afterwards. So. Okay. All right. Well, let's, um, I think we have some territory to cover. Again, so um, I'm going to hand it off to you and. Uh, okay. Sounds good. Let me get it all up and running here. Uh, give me a second. All right. Sorry, it took me a little bit. There's so many things on my screen here that Everything's not responding the way it should. Okay, I wanna welcome everybody to part two of, but I've read it on the internet. Um, oh, I forgot to change the part of the Gray Way series, but we're up there, we're like 23 or 24 or something like that. So again, thank you for your support and for sending in your questions. So off we go. I got a lot of feedback last week, which is really good. Um, people are, I made people think, which was the reason for the webinar. Think about what you're being told, where it's coming from, does it really make sense? And we're gonna get a little bit more in depth. There's a lot of more topics that I wanted to cover. So if there's something that I did not, uh, please put it in the question and answer and we'll try to get to it at the end. So, uh, what I did was I took some of the quotes and stuff that people forwarded me after the uh, last webinar and decided to dive into them a little bit more. So this is what was going on last week. Somebody was recently telling everybody not to use the full spectrum lightings because unless the bird is within five inches of the bulb, it is a waste of money. Now that is incorrect. So in the last several years, there's been an increased number of variety of fluorescent UV spectrum bulbs available for exotic beds. 
highlighted is, however, consumer knowledge is poor and industry standards are lacking, especially for birds. Now, this was written in 2009 uh, by one of my veterinarians. And in general, the bulbs recommended above should be no closer than six inches from the top of the bird's head from the highest perch spot in or on the cage and keep the bulb no farther than 12 to 18 inches. I've always told everybody 18 inches because that's what I was told. So in the chat, if you can tell me what is wrong with that picture that you're looking at. See if I can bring it up. Okay, does anybody see anything wrong with that picture? All right, I'm not seeing any responses. So what's wrong with this picture is, is that light that I'm hanging there above the cage is higher than 18 inches. Now, this was my room. Uh, this is my bird room right before I had uh, it made into the night room. So their cages were still in there, but that light was actually from when their big cages used to be in there when we were building the bird room. So that light was not really being used, but it's a perfect example that the light should be over them and lower. You don't want to have something that's next to the cage shining on the bird because then the bird can have issues with its eyes. Imagine us just staring into a light bulb, what it's going to do. So I always suggest overhead. Now, where I got this information from, these were all the references that were quoted in regards to the article. I am more apt to believe the person writing this, along with all the references that I can look up, than somebody just on the internet. So where I found this was from Dr. Laura Wade. We talked about it just barely last week, but that's a great link to go in and look and see what your birds need, how to use it. Again, since 2009, some things have been updated, uh, but this is the basics, what you wanna follow and the type of lighting that was tested and recommended. Another one was, talking about bird bread and how it is not healthy for your birds and you shouldn't feed it. Um, I would think the hormonal part from giving your birds bird bread is gonna be the warm bread um, and maybe the carbohydrates, um, making them a little bit more feisty depending on what's going in there. You wanna keep in mind that regular bread that we all love has um, zero nutrition for birds. If you're using the mixes, you have to make sure you don't get an added sugar one because the ones that we probably see all the pictures of are going to have sugar in them. So what I usually do is I suggest to people if they're trying to switch their birds onto a pelleted diet, you never withhold food. You can add the pellets in, but the birds, if they're used to something in their bowl, they may not necessarily right, go to a pellet. So instead of wasting all these pellets and throwing them out, you can certainly crush them up in a food processor, uh, make them smaller, You know, use it as part of a bird red and the person who sent me this she actually is she's doing pretty good with her recipes here she's using her veggies her leftover pellets some almonds walnuts and pine nuts um unprocessed raw oats sugar-free applesauce and an egg in reality several companies have pre-made bird breads again um if they're pre-made and some of them um, are from companies that have had vets working there or by vets, and I highly doubt that they would be putting out anything that's going to be dangerous for your bird. Now, as, as far as the ingredients you're looking in there, again, you have to remember, it, people are questioning the forms of vitamins and minerals that are used. The names are hard to pronounce. It doesn't mean it's something bad. It just means the company is being transparent about what they put in the product. 
We had one person write in about uh, working with an Amazon who has been a seven time foster fail and that the original person may have not known the best things to do in regards to behavior um, and how they've been working with it to to make things better. Um, she wrote in and she asked me to please talk about it just real quick and we will. Um, I wanted to know how she has been correcting the behavior that was given to the original owners from reading it on the internet to discourage any attacking behaviors and such. She wrote that she's using the word no with proper vocalization and timeout, as well as using toys to find out what types he likes and using forage also. So in reality, she's trying to redirect behavior and she's giving him something else to do. Also patients understanding bird behavior. Now people with specific species and mixed flocks, you know that an African gray behavior is gonna be a little bit different than an Amazon behavior, which is gonna be different than a cockatoo behavior. So you have to understand and be patient with your species and what their natural behaviors are and how they show you that they're excited. Uh, one of the things that ties it all together is she's giving the right type of attention. And yes, again, redirecting behavior. So quickly, we're gonna go into the ABCs. Uh, the ABCs, you got to keep this in mind when you are working with behavior and you're seeing all this bad stuff online and you're not, and we're going to touch on that. This is what you want to keep in mind. So an ABC model is a tool that all of us can help examine a behavior and understand its key behold, behold, yeah, components. Behavior happens for a reason. It's not just because the bird attacked you for no reason. They didn't see what was going on. So the antecedent is gonna be what happens before the behavior occurs. The second thing is the behavior is what the bird does. It's an observable such as chasing the owner, but they can also find internal such as being excited because internal behaviors can only be inferred. We can only guess what they're thinking. Most behavioral inter interventions focus on external behaviors that are observed and measurable. And then see the consequence is anything that immediately follows the behavior, the result of the behavior. So consequences can increase or decrease the likelihood of a behavior happening. So she's got to watch with this Amazon or all of us have to watch with our birds. See what is the antecedent to set them off, what the bird is doing, and what we can do to correct it. Avoid reinforcing the wrong behaviors. All the time, people online think it's really cute when the bird's chasing their feet and then they have a problem and the bird bites their feet. Or people think it's really cute when they're nesting under the, you know, the antique armoire and then all of a sudden the antique armoire's legs are, are destroyed. And that's because they're reinforcing the wrong behaviors. Another thing circulating around the net is only to have your bird in a cage when they sleep or in the car because it'll create problem. I don't know where this came from. Um, this is bad advice. You, in reality, none of us can always have our birds out and around and with us all the time besides sleeping. We need to build independence. So these cute little cuddly babies, when they come home, of course they're gonna wanna be with you. They they don't know the environment, they're nervous. We start carrying them around and then our life kicks in and we can't. So now the bird's gotta go in the cage. The bird doesn't understand why it's in the cage. And this is where we start on the, having problems. So you wanna make sure that you're building independence by not always having that bird right with you. And this happens to be um, a little trinket box that I have by Harmony Kingdom. It's really cute, and the birds really look like they're trying to get out. You want to make sure that the cage environment is fun. All right, so if, if you're putting your bird in a cage and it's spending time and it's getting independent than always being with you or always being out and creating issues, you have to give them fun things to do. There's nothing wrong with either one of these cages and these birds are preoccupied with themselves. 
So I'm not seeing it as any kind of punishment. Then you also, these are my sleep cages after I did the bird room. So you can even see in there, they have little toys, not much, but they can play at night before they go to sleep if they choose to. And then they can play in the morning if they want to before I get them up. Also note that I do not have their water dishes in there just yet, but they do have food and water at night. Next thing we're gonna talk about is don't shop adopt. Don't get me wrong, I love adoptions. I help a lot of people rehome their birds, find new birds. Um, I didn't sell any life in my store, I was about adoption. I, there is also a need for good breeders and the two sides shouldn't be so far apart. I think we're both against the backyard breeders, the ones that are not taking care of their birds, the ones that are suffering and have no stimulation and are just egg producers. But there's also fantastic breeders out there and we need them in order to have more generations. We can't be interbreeding on the same things over and over like some of them do. We need good ones. So adoptions are fantastic. Um, majority of mine have been adopted. I took them into my home. But adoption is not for everybody. You want to, with, with a first-time bird owner, and we'll get into this, to this as well, um, they might not be able to handle a larger bird. They might not be able to handle an older bird. I've had some birds that came in that were a handful. And luckily I knew about the species enough to avoid a bite and how to handle them. But if you have a, a, a new owner that has just been researching some sort of bird to adopt because they think they're gonna be cute, you don't wanna be putting an adult more aggressive type bird into their home because then the bird's not going to stay there it's not going to last and then the person who showed that interest is now done with birds so we've not only had the bird in another house we've also didn't foster the um the new owner that may have really benefited and added to agriculture This is mine um, that really irks me. Uh, I see a lot of people saying, I'm rescuing a bird, I'm rescuing a bird. I'm not sure if it's because it makes them feel better, um, but taking in an older bird is not a rescue. It is rehoming or it's adopting, however you wanna put it, but it is not a rescue. So all these birds right here were rehomed into my house. They either lost their homes, weren't wanted, or their owners died and they came to live with me. So taking in an older bird is really opening your heart and home to a bird in need. This is a rescue, all right? If you say you're taking in a rescue, this is what I'm thinking. The bird's been in deplorable conditions and it needs help. Now all these birds, these are rescues. They were taken in by Eastern Avian uh, Sanctuary of Tennessee. And they all got medical attention and they're all doing quite well right now. And this is what a rescue is. It's not this bird who came to live with me because her owner died. Another thing you see on the internet is all birds can talk. No, they can't. Um, one of the main things you'll see people say is I want to get a talking bird. Well, you shouldn't buy a bird just because it's going to talk. If it does, that's the icing on the cake. Uh, I have five African greys. I have two that can talk rather well when they want to. I have one that says some words and I have two that don't say anything at all. But the problem with that is when I've seen so many owners come online and say, well, I bought this bird because it's supposed to talk and it hasn't talked at all, so it's stupid. No, the bird is not stupid. Most bird people with experience will understand that these birds can talk to you without using human language. You can follow their body language. You can follow their noises. This is Emma. She doesn't say a word. 
I know exactly what she wants at any time. If she wants to go out and, and go right, she'll lean right. If she wants to step up, she'll pick up her foot. If she doesn't want to step up, she'll put down her head. So, if, you know, if she's hungry, she has one noise. If she sees my husband get up and move, she's a great watchdog. If she sees my husband get up off the couch and move, she'll have a scream. So I know he's on the move somewhere. So she doesn't need to talk to me in human language. And she's certainly not stupid. So that's real problem I have with, with people sharing that on the internet and, and no, all birds can't talk. Alex Foundation and the birds there, um, people are like, well, I bought it because of Alex. Well, Alex has had, and the birds there have had so many hours a day, whether it's eight hours a day of learning and teaching and model rival techniques being used and it's a training session. It's not just you sitting there to your bird saying, how you doing today? So there's a big difference who's going to spend all that time. And there's a couple on the internet that have done quite well. But you, I can't expect to go out and buy an African gray or rehome an African gray and it to act like Alex or Griffin or Athena. Products that are sold that are not safe for parrots. You see, you see, People um, either talk about businesses or talk about products that, you know, they people need to get or you need this or it's the best. Well, you, you have to use some common sense here. And I found this, I think, on Wayfair. Now, we can all tell that 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 bird there is obviously photoshopped and the size of that cage is 16 by 14 by 14. It weighs 9.1 pounds. Do you really think a macaw is going to fit in there? But yet people will see that and say, oh, it's so cute. I'm going to buy it. And then they realize it's not even big enough for a canary, nor can a canary get around in it. So you have to use your judgment with different foods, products, and who you are patronizing. Now, a bigger company that's just on the Internet is probably not going to know as much about their products and what they're selling if they have hundreds of thousands of products versus the small store who knows exactly what product you need. The food that you're giving, and a lot of people laugh at me when I when I was had a storefront and the people would come in um, and they would talk about their different pellets. Some of the pellets, you have warnings on the side. They are not for human consumption. Not that I'm gonna sit down and have a dinner of pellets, but if I can't eat something, I'm not gonna give it to my bird. So I would have examples of foods in there that were not for sale. They could go somewhere else and buy it, but it wasn't what I was selling. And I would have them read the bag. And then it would point, I would point out to them, you know, what, what was in there and if they thought it was a good idea. Um, I've, test, I've tasted just about every pellet that's out there. I haven't died and I haven't grown feathers. So um, I always sampled everything and you gotta make sure that what you're, what you're offering, is it safe for you to eat before you give it to the bird? Products, are they recommended by veterinarians for your pet bird? Say as in toys? Are they using safe components to make toys? I remember way back when, when my bird was sick and I had to go to the hospital and I brought a little hospital cage with me and I had his toys to make him feel comfortable because I knew he wasn't coming home. And my vet, which I'm very thankful for now, but I didn't understand at the time, they looked at my toys and they said, we're gonna take this out and we're throwing it out. And I'm thinking, I just spent money on that. Why are you doing that? Well, it wasn't a safe toy. And again, that helped me later in life when I knew I wasn't gonna sell that toy because you know what? It wasn't recommended by the veterinarian. So you have to make sure when you're looking at something, um, and I know it's very hard online, you have to, with the toys that come on the wires, you have to make sure that it is a correct thickness for your large beak bird. I can't tell you how many toys I've thrown out or dissembled and gave pieces away versus putting them on my shelf to sell. 
Is the company you are supporting with your purchases giving back to the community and have a good reputation? Are the people recommending them due to their positive interactions, or is it because the more people you send to them, the more discounts they get? So again, information on their internet. You got to go here. They're great for this. They do this, do that. Well, you got to think, do they have a good reputation? Do they stand by their clients? Or is it because people are getting kickbacks because they recommended people? So watch out for that and use your judgment. Another one is Teflon. Somebody asked me to please bring this up. Teflon toxicity in your home. People say Teflon is safe, just don't overheat the pan. Now this is nationwide, it came from their site and this is actually the insurance that I have on my birds. The first nonstick pan coated with um, PETFE was created in 54 and the resin was called TFAL. I, I remember that um, growing up. It was the first made nonstick uh, frying pan was called the happy pan. It's commonly known by DuPont and named Teflon. The toxicity occurs when the nonstick cookware and other products, and it's in so many different products, uh, is overheated at temperatures. It degrades the PF, PTFE and microscopic airborne particles are released and then inhaled. Birds are particularly sensitive to airborne particulates, and you should know that, and gas emissions, even in small dosage due to their high metabolic rate and unique anatomy. anatomy. The same gases can also cause harm to people and other animals in case of household exposure. So I'm not really sure why people insist on using this. You have um, Teflon coated pans, you have it in your oven, you have it in your toaster, you have it in your um, to, uh, you know, countertop uh, oven, you have it um, in your hair dryer. It's in so many different things and people will write to me and ask, is this safe? I don't know the components in every single one. So I always suggest write the company and don't accept the first answer because it might be a canned answer. Yes, it is right back and get the information. And the good companies are gonna reach out to you. They're gonna do their investigation and there's gonna be warnings and they're gonna tell you the truth because they don't wanna have problems and you certainly don't want to. So not many birds survive toxicity. And the best course of action is to ensure your bird's health is prevention. Remove all your nonstick cough, uh, cookware and products that you know that are gonna be around your bird to eliminate the entire threat. If you can't remove everything, okay, we can't remove our stoves, um, there's something that we just can't get rid of in the household, you're gonna make sure that you're taking caution. You don't wanna have your birds near the kitchen while you're cooking. I don't particularly like that they're there anyway. Um, for a safety level for them and a cleanliness level for you. Um, I know some people have to do that, but I would certainly remove them uh, when you're doing any kind of cooking because, you know, just about everything has smoke. Um, you know, I've, I've set off things before. Uh, luckily I have air purifiers and I have ceiling fans, but, you know, I'm always worried as soon as, you know, the smoke starts appearing um, and move your, like I said, move your, bird's cage out of the kitchen to a less exposed area. And one of the best things you can do, and again, this is from the nationwide site, discuss uh, PTFE intoxication with your veterinarian to ensure your bird has a safe, healthy environment that you can both be comfortable with. Just don't go by somebody on the net saying, oh, I've used my pan for 20 years and nothing's happened. Or, you know, my bird's right next to the oven when I use the self-cleaning. The key there is it hasn't happened yet. These people are taking risks with their bird's life every time they do this. Uh, this is actually written many years ago by our host, um, Cleaning Products. 
Again, you're going to see some cleaning products out there that are going to say that they are bird safe. They usually say animal safe. Just because it says animal safe does not make it bird safe. They're completely different things with different respiratory systems. And, you know, there are some bird safe products that are out there uh, that you can get at bird stores and online and stuff. Um, and they're specifically made with birds in mind. I tend to use a lot of vinegar in my house. It smells like one big nasty salad um, when we're done. But I also know that it's not going to harm my birds and it's going to be safe. And as far as like candles and senses and tobacco and all that, none of that is safe to be around your birds. You're going to see people online. Well, you know, I, I use I use different type of infusers or, you know, I use wax melts. I use all this stuff and my bird's been just fine. I burn incense and we smoke cigars and cigarettes. And again, that is all taking your bird's life at risk. Um, this is actually posted on my Facebook page and somebody wrote to Sensi in the middle of all this discussion about this is, this is created for animals and blah, blah, blah. And again, animals are different than birds and you have to be very careful. So kudos to Sensi for saying it's not safe around parrots. Now they say a lot of their customers use the product but since you cannot guarantee the products are safe for use around the birds, uh, indoor birds are delicate. And according to bird veterinarians, breeders, and resellers, any Sensi products can cause illness or fatalities in birds. Um, you can go to that bird, uh, the website there, and you know you can see that the airborne agents can create. Critical respiratory events, aerosols, burning candles, incense, cleaning products, smoke, all that kind of stuff. Not good to be around. And I don't care if you've been doing it for 20 years, you're killing your birds slowly. Here we go, internet bullies. They come in all shapes and sizes and they hide behind the computer screen. I like to think of it this way. When somebody treats you nasty or poorly, don't take it personally. I know it's hard to, but don't. This is nothing about you, but all about them, okay? So you'll see a lot of people coming online and they'll be asking very simple questions. It could be, I'd like to introduce pellets or I would like to buy a toy for my bird. What do you suggest? And you have a lot of people joining in and it seems to be they go in packs. It's usually not just one person. Excuse me. Who's being big mouth? Um, it, it's usually not just one individual. One person will start, everybody else piles on. There's really no room for that on the internet. Um, people are coming there for help, not to be belittled or be treated poorly. So I see this a lot berating them for not having the same products available. A lot of people overseas do not have pet stores. They don't have the same products. Hold on, I'm going to get Sydney, so he'll be quiet. Come here. Come here. We can't have that. We're supposed to be good. Okay. Berating them for not having the same products available as we have here. So happens a lot with cages, it happens a lot with toys. People are proud uh, to be owners and to care for their for animals and they'll show a picture. And again, you'll have 30 people jump on and say, oh, you shouldn't own a bird. You know, you, you, your cage is horrible. Look at the toys, it needs more toys. These people aren't coming on to be talked down to. They're coming on for help. So instead of telling them they're wrong or they should do this, explain to them, help them. Maybe they don't have access to the toys. Explain to them why that toy may not be safe. Explain to them how to make a toy. Maybe send them to a toy making um, page to help them out. Don't 
put them down for not having the same access you do. I know it's very hard when they come online and they'll ask for medical stuff because they don't have vets in their country. There's nothing we can do as other owners behind the internet screen to change that. So we have to try to help it. There are vets that will do consoles with other vets overseas. So that is an option you could tell them instead of telling them you shouldn't have bought a bird and you're killing your bird and why'd you buy it so young and so and so. It's not helping anybody. And usually the people disappear and we never know what happens to those birds. Being condescending for not having the same social status. I've seen a lot of, I think that's an adorable picture. Um, my, people will say my birds have this. Uh, yeah, they have a great big stainless steel cage and you don't. Well, th the person that may not have that stainless steel cage or may not have the biggest and newest foraging toys, doesn't mean that they don't love their bird any less than you love yours. So by them saying, my bird has this and yours doesn't, you're wrong. That's, that's incorrect. Again, teach them, help them. People will say, oh, that cage is horrible because they have a great big walk-in cage that they have in their house. And somebody, maybe that may be older, maybe somebody like me that is now having some health issues. You can't have this great big cage that you can't move. Um, you have to have something that's right for them and manageable for you in order to take care of everything correctly. So by telling somebody that cage is horrible is not helping. You need to feed this food. You hear it all the time. Oh, you're killing your bird with seed. Again, seed can be used as a treat. Um, I use some as part of my diet for them. It's a very small amount. It's like a teaspoon, um, but that is not gonna instantaneously kill your bird. It's long time um, medical issues you can have from just having a seed diet. But just because your bird will eat this diet and that's what you use, doesn't mean that everybody else in the world has to use the same diet, all right? The best pellet is the one that you can get your bird to eat. This is an issue, again, a lot of time overseas, you will see somebody that has a leg chain on their bird. That is what they have been taught. It's not that they're being mean. Um, it's not that they're being stupid. It's because that's what their customs taught them. So we have to help them instead of just yelling at them and say, you should have your leg chained. Help them to understand why it's not a good idea and hopefully encourage and foster a new type of bird keeping over there. And it starts one person at a time. I've seen a lot of great people overseas who have evolved and they're getting their bird bigger, better cages than they were originally. The chains are coming off, but don't be the person to jump on and hurt somebody for not knowing any better. And then again, typical, maybe you don't have the same size cage, maybe you're not feeding the same pellets, maybe you don't have these fantastic toys. Um, and people say, well, you shouldn't be allowed to have birds. Well, you know, no one came in and said that you are the end goal to everything. So these people, again, probably love their birds, maybe even a little bit more than you do. Um, because, I mean, I've had people through the store and through the years and adopting birds out, um, buy birds to be an ornament in a room. Birds are not ornament. They make messes. They're loud. They can bite. They're going to make a mess. Um, and then they come in and they want this tiny little cage for the bird, which I would not sell. And then they want these little parakeet type toys for Amazons, which I would not sell. Um, and then they get angry because they say they don't want to spend this money on that bird. Well, the bird deserves it. Um, I'm not going to tell her she shouldn't be allowed to have birds, but she should. We should try to educate her a little bit more and hopefully her hope help the bird long term. I've actually been uh, criticized for 
sharing this photo because I should be choosing one pellet over the, all the ones that I offer. And I offer a variety, I have five of them. I can't guarantee who's gonna want what, but they are offered different pellets and they can pick and choose and they're pretty good about eating just about all of them. And then if you have an issue with getting a food or something's wrong, then you have other ones to fall back on. But that's how I've always thought. And, you know, there's a nice variety in there and I've been bullied and told I was wrong for offering more than one food. This is a big one making you feel less of an owner due to plucking. And this is actually very sad. I can tell you, I do have some pluckers. Um, you see by my bird room that I have good cages. The majority of the cages look just about alike. Three of them are exactly alike. They all have the same trees. They all have the same diet. They all get the same attention. Um, no one is showered with more attention than the other one. And yet I've had people tell me that I don't know what I'm doing because my bird is plucking. Now, I know the reasons my bird is plucking, okay? Abby, she's not feeling well. She has heart issues. She plucks in that area. We have Sydney. He has separation anxiety issues. He plucks in a certain area. And then you have Sterling, hormonal. He's gotten a lot better through the 41 years or I would say 35-ish years he's been with my family. He's gotten a lot better. But when hormones kick in, he picks that little Elizabethan collar. Um, I'm not doing anything wrong. Maybe I just haven't figured out how to completely stop it, but I am not less of an owner because my birds pluck. So some of the things I've seen people say online when their birds are plucking and they post pictures and they ask, you know, what can I possibly do? Well, these are, the re these are the answers people have put up. You need to add more toys. Um, if the bird has a medical issue, more toys are not gonna help. You need a bigger cage. This, this tends to be an excuse for a lot of people. You need a bigger cage. Bigger cage is not gonna help a medical problem. Your bird needs a girlfriend. Um, that's not gonna solve anything either. Your bird needs more fruit. I, it's probably not a good idea to be giving more sugars to a bird that might be plucking. And again, it's not really gonna help. Your bird needs a collar. That should be coming from your vet. The bird is plucking from something you did. I hear it all the time. Something you did. And that's horrible because then the owner disappears again away from the internet and we can't help. And the, and the owner looks, um, at the bird, like they're not doing something right. It's the owner's fault, it's a bird fault. And then a lot of times the birds end up losing their homes. I've told stories before about my beautiful African gray Samson Bell who had not a feather out of place. He was gorgeous and he died. I personally would much rather have a naked little bird like Abby and her still being here than a beautifully feathered bird like Sam, who's gone. So when you have a bird that's plucking, what you really need to do, oh, this is another one, your bird needs a new home because it's plucking and you're doing something wrong. So what you really need to know and do if your bird is plucking is your bird needs a vet. Being a consultant, I have a lot of people that will come in and that's one of their main things they're, they're worried about. And I'll ask them to please send me any medical records and get their, you know, okay to review them and maybe discuss it with the vet. Um, I can't really help as a consultant if there's a medical issue. It's important if your bird's plucking, it's important for your vet to look at them first, rule out medical, then come to somebody that can help. Another bad thing, real bad thing, he, we, I'm sure we all see it daily, is getting medical advice. People saying, oh, you don't need a vet. Your most important relationship while you have a bird is going to be with your avian veterinarian. So 
I've seen this online. If a bird's not feeling well, people will ask, is your bird up to date on current shots? Well, there are a couple um, things that maybe in the beginning people might opt to do. Um, but getting older, as far as I'm aware of, they don't need shots. You're going to see this a lot with um, scammers online and people who just don't know. They think their birds are like their dogs and cats. Somebody will ask, is he's, his bird's losing feathers on the back of his head. Is there any treatment? Yes, a vet. We don't know why that's going on, but yet people will put in, oh, you need more toys or you need a bigger cage or it's something you're doing. It's your fault. No, you need a vet. Has your bird been dewormed? I hear this a lot. And while maybe overseas, um, I've heard of some instances over there. And again, I'm not very familiar with everything that happens over there, but maybe because they're hanging outside or maybe because there's such a big concentration of birds because they're still importing them um, in a small market. Maybe they're hanging with the wild birds. There has been some issues and some Places over there have done it. I don't know what they use. I can tell you in my 45 years, I've never been asked that. Mine have never been done. I don't know if it's something in a warmer climate. I don't know. But this something like that just makes me shake my head and, and people should be talking to their vet. My bird has sores on his feet. What does he do? Well, what do you do? You go to the vet. You don't go to the internet to have people say, well, you need softer perches or you need to wrap your perch in vet wrap or you need to rub some neosporin on them or some coconut oil. Um, you need to be evaluated and do the, the correct treatment. You can do your own grooming. This one kind of scares me because the new owner comes in and they see everybody doing their grooming and they could do it too. And then all of a sudden they have a beak that's bleeding, or they cut the wing too too short, or the toenail is bleeding and they don't know what to do. Um, as we talked in part one, you really need to have, if you're going to do something like this, you really need to have your vet go over it with you, decide if you're going to do it, and better yet, have a professional do it. My vet's an hour away and costs too much. My bird's limping and falling off his perch. What can I do to help him? Um... Again, people saying, oh, well, you need to lay the layer the bottom of the cage with towels um, and, you know, you need to give them more sugar and, you know, just watch them. That's not helping. The bird is already hurt and or sick. So the important thing is to have them evaluated and taken care of, not the internet people saying, oh, slap some Manuka honey on them or, you know, do something like that. You need to make sure that he's getting the correct treatment. A vet being hour, an hour away is, would be fabulous for me. I travel two hours each way. As far as costs, um, I don't like to hear anybody saying their vets are too much. These people go through a lot of training. They um, sometimes if they have their own pro um, offices, the machines they need and everything else, just like a human hospital, it's astronomical. These people need to be able to feed their families and pay off all their loans in order to have their offices. And the vets who work for bigger hospitals, they're just employees. They don't set the costs. So being too expensive um, shouldn't be a thought. There is herd insurance you can get. There is care credit you can use. It's no excuse for having a bird that's hurt and not going. My cat has his bird in its mouth. It's not bleeding. What, I sh what should I do? People, oh, well, just watch him. He'll be just fine. You no, know, chances are the bird's not going to make it. And you need to make sure that the bird's been tested and is on a course of antibiotics. And another one is, does, pluck, does a plucking collar need to be fitted by a vet or can you just buy one in a parrot supply store? Um, I have a parrot supply store. I don't sell these. I always tell people they have to go to their vet because the, the collar should be fitted. And there are veterinarians um, that'll start out with a bigger collar and perhaps move to a softer collar. And there's a company, um, Pam's Petals, that actually uh, she does softer 
uh, collars and she works with veterinarians to make sure it's going to be the right fit for your bird. Uh, and that's, you don't just automatically slap a collar on a bird and expect it to get better. That's a band-aid. You need to make sure what's going on with them be fitted correctly, and then you can move to other ones. Bad behavioral advice. Um, I see this all the time, and a lot of times I just I, I shake my head. Um, on my page, I have a lot of uh, my, my African Grey group on Facebook. I have a lot of great people with a lot of knowledge on there. I know they're giving out sound advice if there's a if there's an issue, they'll contact me um, and I'll try to get in there. But if I'm on another page and I try to get in there, I might have a lot of people telling me, you know, how, how to do things with my birds. And I usually just say, OK, thank you. I'm not going to get into any kind of arguments with uh, people online. Um, so this is one that came through. And these are some of the advice that I've seen um, them say. So this person had a 1.5 year old African gray becoming increasingly aggressive and the bird bit, bit, bit her bat on the face and wasn't doing anything but carrying her cage. So how does she stop the bird from biting? Again, we're going to the ABCs. There was something there that happened that made this bird bite. Okay. You have to figure out what it is. And my great people who are tuning in, you know how I talk about that 18 month to 24 month period where they start to become a little bit different and voicing their opinions and carrying on a little bit. So if it's right in that very first spot right there, 1.5 year old. So, um, you know, perhaps if they would have seen my webinars, they would have, you know, realized that, Pretty much all grays go through this and keeping her away from the face would probably be a good idea at this point and continue to work with her going through this stage. I've seen people say, throw your bird to the floor. Well, you risk hurting your bird and the bird's not going to trust you and the bird might retaliate or retaliate's not the word I'm looking for, but you, you know what I'm saying. A bird might decide that next time he's going to bite you a little bit better. Um, Put your bird in the bathtub for poor, poor behavior because the bird can't get out. So let's have the bird go in a bathtub and be stuck in there and be scared. That is really improving your relationship with the bird. And like the bird's going to understand putting him in the top bathtub has to do with his biting. Spray it in the face. This is... Sorry, I had to have my phone on to play a video for you so you can hear the music. Um, spray in the face uh, with the little spray bottles. This is why so many birds end up hating to take a shower. You, you don't ever spray it in the face. How would you like it? Um, this is not a positive interaction, and yet people still do it to this day. Earthquake it. So what they mean by that is the bird's on your hand, and then it bites you, and you're going to shake it down real quick. And of course, it's going to scare the bird even more. The bird might slip and the bird might turn around and try to grab on with his beak because he doesn't have hands and you're gonna get another bite. So how is that helping anything? I've seen people say bite it back. That's really a shame. Um, terrible, terrible advice, a shame. And you gotta wonder about the other things in that person's life that's going on. So with all these things and all these suggestions for the person who was bitten, um, yeah, all those remedies will really teach the bird. People will say all the time, but my bird, and it's fine. One thing as a consultant we really don't like to hear is the word but, because that's justifying what you're doing instead of listening to what we're trying to tell you. So people will say all the time, oh, well, you know, my bird does this and it's fine. Or I, I use Teflon, it's fine. Or I smoke, it's fine. Same thing. So we hear about my bird loves to hide behind the toilet and it's fine. The bird is starting to nest. You're going to have an issue with that. It's going to start attacking people because you're going into its area. That should not be allowed to continue. My bird loves to dig in my mouth. That's just gross. I've seen people post pictures and videos on Facebook of their grays in there chewing on their teeth and, and everything else. And the people giggling and saying, oh, isn't this cute? I don't know why he likes to do that. Well, it's, it's gross. You shouldn't do it. Your bird can get sick and stop. 
My bird loves to chase my husband, well, especially if the bird's in the bathroom behind the toilet and the husband has to go in and, you know, creates a problem because the husband's now in the bird's territory. Um, it might be cute, you know, to have your feet down there and have the bird chasing you like a dog might chase the uh, a ball until the bird gets a hold of your toe. And then all of a sudden it's the bird's problem. The bird sleeps with me. I can't tell you how many people say this and they end up with a dead bird. Um, you don't have a small creature sleeping in your bed when you roll over and just squash it. You need, if you're going to have it in the room, which is probably not a good idea for your sleeping and for the bird's health, um, you keep it in its own little sleep cage. You just don't have it running willy-nilly on the bed until you wake up. But people do it and they say, it's fine, because I heard it on the internet. My bird feeds me all the time. Well, that's hormonal behavior and you need to discourage that. Even though people think it's cute, they're feeding their hands, feeding their, their, their feet, but it's not good for the bird. My bird loves to rub on my feet. Well, of course, because you're letting them. And that's, again, it's sexual behavior and we want to curtail that. Now, this is why I needed my phone at the same time to play found out through um, Zoom that they don't really allow um, the audio on videos. They try to block out the background. So I have my phone here to try to play at the same exact time so you can see. Now, I don't know who this person is, but her videos have been pretty good. She's on TikTok and her name is Liz and she's a, a vet tech. And when parents ask when clients ask why their parrots won't stop masturbating and laying eggs because of their hormonal behavior, let's see if we can get this to play. You ready? One, two, three. Oh, shoot. Let's yeah, see. I thought that was adorable. So were you able to hear it? Uh, no, not on my end. Um... Okay. Uh, I tried with my my phone speaker, hoping it would work. But um, that's the reason your your bird is having eggs and continuously feeding you and masturbating all over is because you are part of the problem. And people post this all the time. They'll show pictures of this. They're they're petting their birds all over, and then they have a problem, and their birds now lay thirteen eggs in a row, and they don't know what to do. Please don't do this. It's not okay to pet them all over. Okay, so we have myths of the internet. Um, we, I'm sure we've all heard this, that female birds only like male humans and vice versa. This is not true. I'm not even sure where this came up with, but it's perpetuated all over the internet all the time. You need to get your bird a friend. While I realize some countries overseas it's a law that you have to have two birds and not just one. I always tell people that, you know, if you've gone to college, do you like, did you like your roommate? Okay. Would you want your neighbor to go pick your friend and expect it to be the best thing and be in one cage together? That's really not how it works. Okay. My guys all have separate everything because they all can't get along and they're not going to share. So it's, it's, better for everybody involved to have their own thing. And even though there's five of them, doesn't mean they're friends. An older bird is someone else's problem. Now this goes back to adoptions. I hate to hear this. There are some fantastic birds out there that are older that need homes. They usually lost their owners, um, they, they lost their homes, Maybe the owners can't afford to take care of them anymore and they're looking for a better option. I would hope after someone goes and buys a bird from a responsible breeder that they would consider opening their homes up through adoption for an older bird. African gray parrots live to be 100. No, they don't. Um, we don't know where this came up either. Um, I've been told they can live up to about 50, but the majority of them don't make it that far due to illness, neglect, diet, um, you know, accidents. So 
I, my Sterling is 41. I certainly hope he lives to be 100, but that's not reality. Macaws are great apartment birds. Uh, I actually knew somebody that went to buy a cockatiel for an apartment, and they ended up leaving with a macaw because the store said macaws are great apartment birds. Um, no, they're not. And your cockatoo will love everyone forever. Uh, well, we've had a couple cockatoos in our home, and, and that when I lived with my father, um, they were his birds, and they certainly did not love me forever. Um, that is just another myth that's out there, and you hear it all the time. Cuddly little baby, and yes, your cockatoo as it matures, it's probably going to stay cuddly and want the hands on, but you saw from the vet tech I just featured, that's part of the reason. Um, you know, your, your birds are going to grow, they're going to mature, they're going to have their own opinions, their own thoughts, and that is perfectly fine. They're not little robots, they are parrots. And your bird will always be this sweet. Well, Sydney was really sweet as a, as a hand-fed baby. And I have my trials with him, just like everybody else does. And we learn from each other. But these are myths that are not true that you see on the internet almost on a daily basis. So I like to, you know, kind of leave off with this um, because it, this, this is kind of the truth. Um, not bird, not all birds can talk. Parrots bite. They can be loud. They may have a special person. They're not cuddly. Babies will change. They they have long lives compared to dogs and cats. They're destructive. They can pluck. And no two birds are the same. And people rehome them because of the myths they hear on the internet. And why didn't they listen? So I had to quote this because I couldn't figure out a better ending to the webinar than this. If your birds are thriving on food and care you provide, don't make changes because of the latest big bad that is being spread on social media. Don't second guess yourself because you've read it on the internet. And I'd like to thank everybody for joining in. Let me stop share. All right. Wow, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Brenda, for that I'm quote. sorry. I see, I see I went a little over. I'm sorry. No, no, that was good. Um, although we won't have time for questions, but we'll 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 just let if you didn't get yeah, we'll get to the questions and maybe we'll we'll, we'll email them to you. Um so if you had a That's question, we'll, we'll get back to you. And I just real quick, I want to point out the one uh, one of the things that I that I've heard over the years, uh, especially at Bird Talk, was um when people had asked. Uh, someone, if they had a parrot, they would say no, but you know, I had a cockatiel or budgie growing up, but the whole small bird misnomer of them not being parrots just drove me crazy. Like cockatiels and budgies because they are parrots. They're just small ones. And, and I, I think that kind of, in a way, it kind of makes people treat them a little differently. Cause they're, I don't know. I just, do you ever get that vibe with, with the small birds too, that and I have to say, I think the most perfect parrot is going to be a cockatiel. I absolutely love them. People call them starter birds. They are forever birds. They are fantastic with family. Um, you know, you're, you're, while yes, they can bite, they're not gonna make you bleed like an African gray is going to. Um, their toys are less expensive. The cage is less expensive. The medical is gonna be the same, but they are just the perfect family bird that don't have all the issues of say a gray or a cockatoo or a macaw and people just dismiss them and call them a starter bird or they're not really parrots yes they are they're fantastic parrots there you go yeah and i mean little budgies man people they could talk up a storm people don't realize their vocabularies are massive <laughs> so. right exactly exactly um uh, disco look up disco the parakeet and you'll see they he's talked way more than any of my birds combined there you go. All right. So, <laughs> okay. Well, let's see here. Um, I have to announce uh, today's winner. We have a giveaway and that is going out to Robert Twigger. Congratulations. You are going to be receiving uh, this awesome 
a gold tin and it has the uh the latest uh it's a collect I, I have to learn how to do this proper someday it's the gold tin with the banana nutriberries there you go uh that's going to be going out to you uh, as well as another lefebvre product of your bird's choice um and guess what that is it for uh August for our webinars. We'll be back um, September 15th with Dr. Lamb. And Dr. Lamb's going to give us the lowdown of um, the Exotics Con uh, conference that uh, that took place. So she's going to give us, uh, uh, walk us through all the latest uh, advancements in uh, avian medicine, hopefully. So nice. you guys can do that. And then um, let's see, when do we see you again, Lisa? We see you, uh, oh, September 22nd. Uh, just to sneak preview, that's going to be asked any Lisa, anything about grays. So save up your great questions because Lisa's gonna say just them. about anything. <laughs> no, anything. I'm just kidding. No, just I'll have to qualify that a little bit. All right, everybody. On that note, um, Lisa, thank you again. Excellent presentation. Um thank and you. a lot of good, a got a lot of good um takeaways and knowledge that uh that empower us to to take the best care of our birds as possible. Uh, on that note, I'm going to wish everyone a very happy weekend. All the best to you and your flock. Stay safe. Stay cool. Until next time, everybody. Bye.